Peter Dawson is director of the Prison Reform Trust, and he has kindly agreed to be interviewed by me on behalf of Humanistically Speaking to discuss government plans for the future of prisons in the UK. Now, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Peter for agreeing to, to be interviewed and welcome to Humanistically Speaking, Peter. Um, let me start by asking you how you came to be the director of the Prison Reform Trust. I mean, uh, you started out as a civil servant uh, from the Home Office uh, and you have pursued, you could have pursued a comfortable career from then, uh, but instead you became involved in the hardline charity work that relates to prisons. So was there a particular incident that caused you to change direction? Um, I don't know if I can trace it back to a, an incident, but um, I mean, like lots of people, I kind of fell out of university not knowing what I was going to do and wound up in the civil service. Um, but after a few years uh, working in the Home Office, mainly on immigration, was given the job in what was then prison service headquarters dealing with policy about prisons. And so got to visit my first prison. And, you know, like most people, you know, to be honest, from my background, I knew absolutely nothing about prisons. Um, and, and they are incredibly fascinating places. But, but you quickly realise they're incredibly important places too. And I guess if you're in the civil service, um, what, what you long for is to get your teeth into something that you feel really matters um, and prisons really matter. So I got to know a lot about prisons by visiting them and um, coming across some very interesting, inspirational people, actually, <coughs> pardon me, who both worked in them and lived in them and conceived the idea that I would quite like to move from sitting in an office in Whitehall talking about prisons to actually working in prisons. I was able to do that uh, around 1999 and ended up governing two prisons, so spent about 11 or 12 years working in prisons on the operational side. Um, uh, so actually as a, a governor of a big prison in Surrey for about six and a half years. Um, and uh, when that came to an end, I went and worked in the private sector for two and a half years for one of the big companies that um, runs prisons. Uh, and then moved on from that to the Prison Reform Trust about six years ago, which um, I mean, if, if the way I would characterise it is that it's, it's an immense privilege because I get to do things like this and tell the world my opinions um, and say all sorts of things that probably I couldn't easily have said when I was working inside government. Mm. Um, the, 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 the downside, of course, is that you're, you're influencing, you're looking to get other people to do what you want them to do, whereas the, you know, the joy really of being a prison governor is that you have quite a lot of scope just to make things happen. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, being constrained uh, by, by government because I have tried to get in touch with the, with the uh, Prison Governors Association um, and uh, they weren't too keen to, uh, to talk to me. And I don't, know, I don't know why, maybe it was uh, because they're connected with the governments. Perhaps they just... Um, I I, I would doubt that. Um, I suspect it's probably because the Prison Governors Association is a, um, well, it's a, it's a woman and a dog. I mean, it's a, a tiny outfit mm. looking after the interests of thousands of members um, at a particularly difficult time. So uh, they probably just got a, a bit less time. I mean, the, the Prison Governors Association is independent and has been quite outspoken during the pandemic. So keep trying. Well, so have you been uh, uh, quite outspoken, but we'll come back to that later. Uh, now, tell me a little more about uh, about the Prison Reform Trust, because lots of people know about the Howard uh, Reform Society, uh, but maybe not quite so many. You haven't been around as long as they have. Um, but as I understand it, it was a breakaway organisation from the Howard League uh, for that was founded in 1981. So can you tell us a bit more why that was a breakaway? and What's the difference between mm -hmm. the two organisations? Um, I, I think you, you need to go back to your sources. I, I, I don't think it was a breakaway. Um, I mean, it was just a, another charity set up with similar aims. Um, right. I'm right, we're a relative newcomer at only 40 years in, but we've, funnily enough, we've just, um, just published a short history of Prison Reform Trust to celebrate our 40th anniversary. And it was really conceived by a small group of people who were concerned about prisons. I mean, it, you know, I'm not being unkind about them when I say they, they all came from sort of the, if you like, the chattering classes, except that many of them were 
you know, very eminent in their own field. And their view back in 1981 was that the state of prisons was so dismal, was so poor, that if the public was simply properly informed about the scandals in the prison service that their taxes funded, that the pressure for reform would be instantaneous and overwhelming and prisons would become better through the public knowing about them. Um, it turned out that wasn't true. And 40 years later, we are still having to advocate very hard across a whole series of issues to, to make sure that the government of the day takes prisons as seriously as any other public service, albeit that it's one that is provided to a group of people who on the whole have um, got the rough end of the, the deal. Yeah, I must admit, I was pretty shocked uh, when I read some of the material um, while I was doing research for this interview, uh, just about how poor uh, the prison um, conditions were. Um, and I will come back to that later in the interview. But uh, as a slight sideline to that, we seem to be uh, banging up more people than ever uh, these days than we did before. Now, this might seem a, an odd question to ask, but what do you put the, the main reason for this? Uh, is there more crime now than there was before? Uh, it's, it's not an odd question at all. It's, it's a great question. And I, I, wish, I wish I was asked it more often because the answer is that we've got more people in prison than we ever have had. And we've got more people in prison per capita than any other country in Europe because the length of our sentences are so long. So actually, the number of people being sent to prison has fallen quite dramatically over the last 10 years. Um, it, it's almost half. But the length of sentences has gone up, um, not quite by 100%, but it's gone up from around three years to around five and a half years. That's extraordinary. Yes. And it, it's not by accident. So governments have progressively made sentencing more severe as a deliberate um, particularly uh, an act back in 2003, which dealt with life sentences and set minimum periods that people had to serve in prison for certain crimes. And what that does, I mean, sentencing is like a piece of elastic. If you, if you pull the top of it, then everything else has to move up underneath. So if you, you say we are legislating just for the worst possible crimes, normally, to be honest, in response to an example of a particularly notorious crime. But of course, as judges interpret sentences for everything else, they have to say, well, the, the gap between the worst murder and the murder that's not quite so bad can't be 20 years. So we have to push up the next layer down. And then the gap between that murder and a gross bodily harm, that has grievous bodily harm, has to go up. And the gap between that and an actual bodily harm has to be uh, adjusted. So you get a general sentence inflation because of that effect. And then, as I say, you, I mean, you, you could pick up, you know, a sample of newspapers from pretty much any month and find that somebody somewhere is saying that the answer to their particular problem is a more severe penalty. And generally that means imprisonment. Um, and generally it's done on the basis that people think that a more severe penalty will deter others from doing the same. But there, there just isn't any evidence from anywhere in the world that deterrence works in terms of sentence length. It, it's one of those things that everybody assumes does work, but it doesn't. I must say, uh, I mean, I, I find that really quite worrying because what you seem to be implying is it's a mixture of uh, uh, public uh, shock and maybe panic. Uh, and uh, and governments responding in a political way to a situation that actually needs a more nuanced, a more considered uh, response. Uh, and I, I notice that your first objective seems to be uh, to keep uh, persistent and petty criminals out of prison altogether, uh, which might uh, help the whole thing. Um, but with respect to petty criminals, and I know you've been talking about murders, but with respect to petty criminals, if they persistently commit crime, What's the alternative? Yeah, no, it, it, in a way, it's the hardest thing for us to answer. But well, it, it, there's two really important things to say. First of all, there is research that shows that if you keep on going with community penalties, eventually you get a better result. 
with persistent offenders. Um, and that, you know, that, that's important because we, we can all get frustrated about any number of things, but being frustrated isn't a reason for doing something that probably makes it worse. And prison makes it worse for, for very obvious reasons. You know, prison takes away your home, your family, your job, and it poisons that for years to come. Um, and all of those things, the research shows us of what pe people are out of crime. So you're, you're undermining the things that are likely to help. But the other thing that I always want to say about persistent offenders is that we concentrate on the situation that the magistrate or the judge faces on the 20th occasion that someone is up in front of them. And they say, with absolute justification, I just don't know what else to do. You know, this is the 20th time this person has been here. I owe it to my community to give them a break. But that's not the hearing that we should be looking at. We should be looking at the first hearing or the second hearing or the third hearing and say, why is it at that point that the person got punished in a way which did nothing to help them, but we didn't bother to find out what that person's needs and problems were? That is, there, is there a common denominator? Sorry, uh, I was just going to say, is there a common denominator uh, to, to why people keep coming back? Yes, yes, there are. I mean, the, the, uh, the information about people who end up in prison and who end up in trouble with the police, um, on the whole, poverty is crucial. Um, on the whole, uh, there are mental health issues in much greater abundance than there are in people who don't get into the criminal justice system. Um, there, I mean, there are all sorts of interesting things that you see very often. You see it anecdotally, but it's actually borne out by the research. There is normally trauma in the person's background. Um, very often trauma associated with bereavement, um, but also with violence and sexual abuse in the home. Um, those things have often led to people being in care. So the care system is a route to prison for many people, not for everybody, but for um, a much higher preponderance of people in prison who have been in care than who haven't. So it's, um, you know, I, I sort of like to think of myself as an expert, but actually you don't need to be an expert to understand where this comes from. If you sit in a magistrate's court for a day and listen to the backgrounds of the people who are there and the things they're trying to cope with, um, none of it would really surprise you. Yeah, uh, I, I think that... Um... Uh, I have been doing some research on this and I, I've been bewildered by the facts and figures uh, and the nuances that I've been reading. So it's so refreshing to hear somebody who can who, who can summarise it and, t and tell it what it is. Um, now, on the 5th of July, you sent a letter to Joe Farrar, who is the second permanent secretary within the Ministry of Justice, uh, that essentially related to a report that came to light in the Daily Mail on the 19th of June about a forthcoming government white paper on prisons that would be released in the autumn. Now, I know you work closely with government, or at least you try to, but is it normal to find out about government proposals via newspaper reports? Is that the regular thing? Is that the way they do things these days? Um, it's, it's not the approved method, which is one of the things I was saying in the, in the letter. Um, but is it, you know, is it unheard of? No, I mean, it's, you know, it's the way that governments um, have operated for a very long time, possibly forever. Um, I mean, it's, you know, I used to work inside government, so uh, I'm, I'm not shocked by it in that sense, but it's not a good way to, to go about business. And essentially, it's, it's seeding a report in a paper to see what kind of reaction it gets. Um, and, uh, and that's... Politics that's, first. It's politics. Um, but... Um, but, but the, the, the more important point is that prisons are at an absolutely critical juncture, I and mean, it feels like they always are, but um, for prisons then typically periods of significant reform or change tend to follow significant disasters. So my, my introduction to prisons was back in the late 80s, early 90s, and there was a series of riots, the most famous of which was at Strangeways Prison in Manchester, uh, and following that, a man called Harry Wolf, um, who became the Lord Chief Justice, did a report which is still, you know, the most significant reform report in our prison services history. Um, and, th and that was what got me energised. But 
and the period of reform did follow. But it followed because there had been a catastrophe. Well, there's been a catastrophe in our prisons um, during COVID. Uh, most prisoners have spent the best part of 18 months in effect in solitary confinement for most of that time. So the, the damage to them, that is impossible to calculate. Um, and all the work that you would hope would be being done in prison to get people ready for when they come out of prison hasn't been happening during that time. So the, the risks to us are also very high. Can we just explore? Uh, you've, you've actually gone ahead of me. I was going to ask you a question about the COVID issue, uh, and uh, there's more to say about that, which you'll come back to, I'm sure. But um, one of the things that uh, struck me, when you talk about solitary confinement, let's just analyse what you mean by that for the moment, because um, it, it, it seems that the average prisoner is kept in a, a nine foot by six foot cell. Um, and it seems that, uh, from what I've read, that uh, sometimes there's even two prisoners because of overcrowding in that cell. Now, is that right? I mean, because that seems extraordinary to me. Well, it's, it's, it's true in some prisons. Um, I mean, I'm always conscious when I'm talking to people about prisons that uh, if, if you're not familiar with the system, it can sound as though they're all the same. And they're really not. I mean, our prison system is, is astonishingly diverse. So we have people held in prisons that are over 200 years old. We have people held in prisons that are a few months old. There are prisons that hold 70 or 80 people. There are prisons that hold 1,400. Um, and they have different jobs. So different types of prisons will hold different people at different stages in their sentence and work very differently. But overall, our system is overcrowded by between 20 and 25 percent and has been for the last 35 years. So that means that one in every five or four prisoners is sharing a cell which was designed for fewer people than it holds. Um, typically, that means two people in a cell designed for one. And typically, and, and this is true in the prisons that people tend to have heard of, so, you know, Wandsworth, Liverpool, Bristol, Hull, um, the, the prisons that tend to hit the news normally because of bad reports, and are often between 150, 200 years old. That single cell is about nine foot by six foot in its dimensions. Um, it has a toilet in it, has a small table in it, and it has a bunk in it and a small sink in the corner. All of that in six foot by nine foot? Yeah. So the beds are narrow. Um, there, isn't, there isn't really, there's not really space for two people. Two people can stand at the same time, but they can't do anything at the same time. Um, it's difficult to stretch out um, on the floor. Uh, it's difficult to wash. Um, and you're going to the toilet in a room with somebody else. Um, so it's, you know, it's disgusting. Um, it's, it's a horrible environment. Um, and as I say, around one in five prisoners will be held in conditions that are like that or close to it. Um, and the door, of course, you know, the thing that strikes most people if they find themselves locked in a prison cell is there's no handle. Um, the only way the door can be opened is by somebody from the outside with a key opening it for you. Um, the window, in a very old prison, the window will be set quite high, high up in the wall so you can't see out of it. In a more modern prison, it will be set so you can look out of it. Um, Quite, quite often prisoners don't like more modern prisons because the windows have vents at the side to prevent people passing stuff through the window. Um, but that means the ventilation is poor, they break, um, so they get very stuffy, get very hot. Um, and the, there are standards for the exchange of air in the cell, but of course in a Victorian cell that's very hard to meet. Um, and even in a modern cell, so the air is not changed very often. So just to be clear, we're getting an endlessly increasing prison population um, and prisons are getting more and more crowded. The government did make a promise, I believe, uh, to construct 10,000 more prison spaces, I think in 2015, uh, which actually resulted in just 206, wasn't it? it yes, it resulted in 206 within ah. the years that they gave themselves. Um, so now it's a target for 18,000, but with a target for 2026. Um, right. 
Okay, so in, in, this is five years from 2015 to 2020. Yeah. But they promised 10,000 more, but actually got two, 206. That's right. That's a modest, uh, that's a modest achievement. It's isn't not it? a great return on investment, is it? No. No, it isn't. Uh, and they've made a similar promise uh, for the future to, uh, to cover that, as you've just said. Yeah, yeah, yes, they have. And, and, you know, the government has built lots of new prisons. Um, so we've, you know, we've lived through several decades of prison building. Um, and, and some of the more modern prisons are a good deal more civilised than some of the old prisons. Um, actually, the, the designs for ones they promised to build now have lots of features which we've asked for. So, you know, in new prisons, there will be um, telephones in cells. There'll be no bars on the windows. Um, the sanitation arrangements will be much more civilised. But the, the prison I ran um, in Surrey had two new house blocks built while I was there, which were of a good standard. But the whole time I was there, I had to battle to stop them being overcrowded. So the, the modern single prison cell is the same dimensions as a Victorian single cell. So for one person, it's not generous, but it's, it's adequate, particularly if what you're doing is sleeping in there. You know, if it's not the place where you spend the day. But even in a brand new house block, um, people were saying to me, you need to take two prisoners in those cells. Um, and, um, and it, you know, I did, I did resist it. And um, I, uh, I used all sorts of arguments to show why um, it would be dangerous to do that. Um, and I have to say that, you know, it had to be arguments about it being dangerous rather than it being uncivilized to get anywhere. Um, but, uh, but I know now that prisons like that are being overcrowded. It's, it, it's, it's not just the physical conditions that we keep people in in those cells. What happens in an overcrowded system is that it forces you to keep open prisons which you should really close. Um, it forces you to send people to parts of the country where there is a prison that they can be housed in. So for somebody serving anything other than a very short sentence, their, their typical journey will be they will start in a prison close to the court where they're convicted. They tend to be in a city, they tend to be old and pretty grim. But you get moved out to a prison further away from where you live, often a, a lot further away from where you live, you know, 50 to 100 miles from where you live. And those prisons, are, they're not normally built as prisons. So one of the sort of most common sites for a prison will be a converted RAF station from the Second World War. Because after the war, then those sites were free and available and there were buildings on them and they were converted. And gradually over the years, they get some newer buildings. You still go to some way. There are old RAF hangars still in use as well. And all that now. But, but of course, if you're... If you're building an RAS station in the Second World War, you want it as far away from centres of population as possible, you know, as close to continental Europe as possible. Yeah. You know, ni neither of those things are especially helpful when you're thinking about where to put a prison. So people are moved a long way from their families, and we know that families make a massive difference to people's chances when they're released. Um, it's, it's absolutely, it's a physical out of sight, out of mind sort of exile that we impose. Over, that's overcrowding. If we didn't have an overcrowded system, then we could plan for a prisoner state in the right place. So th this leads to an even darker side of things because uh, in your reports, you, you've made it clear that uh, there's been increasing rates of self-harm uh, yeah. and even suicides. Um, yeah. So, um, I, I mean, prisons are never gonna be happy places, but there's, yeah. there's something really awful about, uh, about forcing people uh, with, with, who have very little resource to actually do the business to actually kill themselves. I mean, it just seems mm. horrendous. Um, uh, what do you put that down to? I mean, uh, all right, it's mental health. Mm. But there's also been a reduction in the number of um, uh, prison wardens and, and uh, uh, presumably a, re a reduction in the amount of care for, for the prisoners themselves. I th I, yeah, I think all of that is true. I mean, it is... It is really complex, and um, you know, my for, for for me, you know, absolutely the worst experience in prison 
or somebody taking their own life. Um, and, and I know that most people who work in prisons would share that. Um, so it has been subject to a huge amount of study. But the, the fundamentals are pretty much as you describe them. So pr prison, is, prison causes pain. Um, you know, we, when we send people to prison, we are always punishing them. We are always call it, causing damage. Um, and the pain comes from the loss of control over your own life, from loneliness, from separation from family, from coming to terms with what you've done. Um, so so that, that's there. You would expect prison to make people more miserable. We know lots of people are going into prison with trauma behind them um, and often with underlying mental and physical health problems. And then as we send people to prison for longer and longer, of course, then the, the hope that keeps people interested in the future, um, because what, you know, one of the hardest things to do in prison, if you're a prisoner, is to think hard about your future. You know, ministers and, and organisations like mine, you know, we like to talk about rehabilitation, we like to say, look for the future, think about the life you can have afterwards. But if you're starting a sentence which is years in prison, that's an unbelievably painful thing to do. Um, and one of the ways people cope is to concentrate on the, the day in front of them. And um, if you lose hope, then of course that makes you more susceptible to taking your own life. But the, the, the thing which is incredibly distressing is that the rate of suicide has gone up sharply in the last 10 years, and it's gone up coinciding with a huge reduction, 25% reduction in the number of staff who work in prison. Um, I mean, I, I always felt that a, a humane prison system could never guarantee to keep everybody alive. Um, ultimately, what, what you would need to do to prevent all suicides would make the way of life intolerable. But for that rate to, to increase, I think speaks to a failure in our prisons and in our prison policy. Um, and it's increased dramatically. Okay, okay. so you, we, we've, we've talked about the, 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 the effect on, on the inmates, but this must have an effect on the staff as well. I mean, uh, can you give some feedback about the, uh, the general um, morale uh, amongst prison staff? Uh, it must be very distressing for them. Some it's, it's a hugely undervalued profession. Um, so, I mean, I, you know, I, I got into prisons by accident. You know, when I said at the very start, they were fascinating. I, f I feel a bit guilty because, you know, prison is not a zoo. Um, you know, you don't work in there because it's fascinating. You should work in there because it's important. But yeah. most people will find themselves in that profession, um, you know, but by accident. Um, there are a few where it's family connection. But it's very easy to spot a good prison officer because a good prison officer manages to retain their compassion and their kindness while doing all the difficult things they have to do day by day. But like any caring profession, and I think prison officer should be a caring profession, you, know, you suffer when it goes wrong. Um, and, uh, you, know, I've, you know, one of my jobs as governor, of course, was to try and support people when there had been a death. And the people who, you know, there are people who find the person dead or not quite dead and try to save them as fail. The most normal form of suicide in prison is by hanging. And if someone is hanging, what the officer is required to do is to go in and try and sustain their weight while somebody else cuts the ligature. I mean, it's incredibly, um, an incredibly traumatic thing to do. Are they all trained in first aid? Um, they, they are, um, and in lots of prisons there will be no uh, professional medical staff immediately on site. Um, but, but that means that you will sometimes be trying to revive someone knowing that they are probably dead. Um, you then have to go through the experience of an investigation, which is, you know, is quite right. Every death is investigated. You will have to go and give evidence at a coroner's court. Um, you, you may not have done everything that you thought you should do. Um, your colleagues may not have done everything that they should have done. Even where everybody has done everything they possibly could, then you are face to face with a family who've lost a loved one. 
Uh, there are prison officers who are trained to go and break the news to families and to be a liaison point after the death. So, you know, at every level for everybody involved, it's a tragic and awful experience. Um, so, you know, that of course that's bad for the morale of, of staff. And, and also, that I say, it's easy to get the spot good prison officers. Like most professions, there are bad prison officers too. Um, and they, they undermine the good work that the good ones do. But everybody gets undermined when there's too much to do in the day. So the, you know, the, the core of good prison officering is listening to prisoners. It's conversations, it's getting to know people, and that, that underpins everything. Um, it underpins safety because you know what's going on. Um, it underpins security if someone wants to escape. It underpins rehabilitation because you can motivate people about the future. And it, and it just makes the day go quickly. You know, it's what, it's what the enjoyable part of the job is. But you can't do that if someone is on the other side of a cell door. And you can't do it if you're answering queries from 25 people all at once. Um, yeah. Uh, there's there's another. Tough oh yes, absolutely. But what what's made it more tough, uh, as I've learned, is is uh, the issue with coronavirus. Now, uh, there there was something astounding about coronavirus that uh, you can tell us about the uh, about um, uh, the overcrowding in prisons, continuing overcrowding in prisons. Um, but um, uh, can you just explore that yourself? Because I know you've said that before about concerns about coronavirus in prisons and the lack of support um a lack of care i suppose that prisoners have had uh while in prison well i mean pr prison is prison is a dangerous place if there's a transmissible disease around so all prisons have got contingency plans and you know uh, often in the winter there will be outbreaks of um sort of methane bug um, very rarely you get really dangerous diseases like TB and um, prisons in Eastern Europe, TB is an endemic disease. But coronavirus took our prison system, like everywhere else, by surprise. Um, and the contingency plans just didn't exist to, to deal with it. Um, and the reason it's so difficult is that something that's transmitted by air um, in confined spaces and where it's transmitted before you see any symptoms. I mean, that's, that's a prison. A prison is lots of confined spaces, and where it's overcrowded, of course, it's people sharing a cell, so it's particularly dangerous. But even without that, you know, you spend a lot of time in doors and a lot of time very close to other people. So it was especially dangerous. Um, it was recognised very early on by the public health experts, um, their first estimate was that many thousands of prisoners might die as a result of this disease. But that one of the, the most obvious things that the government could do would be to release enough prisoners so that at least everybody had a cell of their own. Um, and the government declined to do that. Um, and even when we brought a judicial review challenge, uh, it instituted a scheme which was so tightly drawn um, so sort of mean and bureaucratic in this application uh, only around 250 people were released under it um, so that, that had no impact at all on making it easier for the service to cope um, what, what prisons had to do and in the early weeks prisoners absolutely accepted this because it did feel like it was the only option was to close things down so there was the absolute minimal contact between prisoners and between prisoners and staff um, and that was the, for the safety of everybody. Um, you know, if staff are sick, then the prison doesn't work. Um, if prisoners are sick, then, you know, there's not much you can do if the hospitals are overflowing. Sure. Um, but the failure to release people meant that actually there was never any realisation of that in lots of prisons for many months. Um, and people just had to spend every day in their room with almost nothing to do. So there's a television. Um, but it's got, you know, it's got terrestrial channels. Um, normally, typically, have about nine or ten channels. Um, so it's not like, you know, they haven't become addicted to Netflix or Disney Channel because that's not there. Um, and and 
effectively that has meant solitary confinement. So uh, they've been, they call them distraction packs, you know, but that's that sort of coloring in books and sort of little exercises uh, to do. Um, prisoners have missed their friends. Um, they obviously missed their families. So everything that was going on in the community, prisoners were learning about through radio and through newspapers. Um, members of their family would be dying. They would be scared about what was happening to their children um, and having to cope with that on their own. So we know lots of people in the community have had a similar experience during COVID. Um, and and this is not a competition to see who's had the worst experience. Right. In prisons, it's been more prolonged. I think it's been deeper. And it's still going on in many prisons be because it's a dangerous place. Um, because you can't easily unlock people. Particularly now, because the second big political error, I would say, was not prioritising prison staff and prisoners for vaccination. Um, and again, I'm not saying that's an easy political decision. It absolutely isn't. But it, it was approached on the basis of that there wouldn't be priority for certain professions. So why should prison officers be ahead of police officers, and be ahead of bus drivers, be ahead of supermarket workers? But that's not the point. Um, yeah. Moral judgment. Prison, yeah. That's right. The, the prison is a dangerous environment and vaccination would have made it possible for some of those restrictions to be eased more quickly um, and more effectively. Now, you know, thank heavens, those measures, although incredibly damaging, have stopped thousands of people from dying. Um, so around 450 people have died in prison um, over the last year, which is around 150 more than there would be in the previous year. But, but it's been typical of what's happened in the community. So that, you know, there are lots of old and unwell people in prisons these days. But well, I read that the age is getting older and older and older because of the longer yeah. term in prison. Yeah. Look, look, longer, longer sentences and also the impact of people being convicted later in life, especially for historic sexual offending. Um, oh, yes. It, it, it's a naturally vulnerable population. I would say, I mean, <clears throat> just coming back uh, on, on a few points that you made, about public opinion. Uh, I mean, some people might say that prison needs to be unpleasant and uncomfortable uh, for it to be a deterrent. You must have heard this argument yourself. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I have. Uh, um, well, well, I mean, I think the most obvious thing to say is that it is. Um, and, and it is even if it's done in a very civilised way. Uh, what do you mean, unpleasant or a deterrent, or both? Uh, no, the first, only unpleasant. Unpleasant, yeah. Um, you know, if, if it were a deterrent, people wouldn't be coming back there, and they are. Um, I mean, I think, you know, candidly, um, probably for people like me, with my background, um, and certainly with my knowledge of prisons, prison is a deterrent. You know, I would be terrified of going to prison. Um, but it doesn't need to be a deterrent for me, because I've got no reason to commit crime. Um, you know, I've I'm not likely to. In the very unlikely event that I did commit a crime, it would almost certainly be something where there was no forethought to it at all. So, you know, the most serious crime, murder, is normally committed with no forethought whatsoever, mm. um, which is one of the reasons why it's very, very rarely committed twice. Um, you know, the circumstances in which most people, most middle-class people find themselves in prison quite likely something around using their car. Um, where actually an accident happens and they weren't paying attention. Um, so it, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't work as a deterrent. Um, you know, people in prison haven't been deterred, they're not deterred in the future. It doesn't work as a deterrent any better than saying to your child, if you do that, I'll smack you around the head. You know, we, we know it does. All, all that does is to damage the child and to damage the person inflicting the, the punishment. Um, well, that, that brings me on to uh, recidivism rates, because I, I've been trying to uh, find uh, information on that. And it, again, I'm overwhelmed uh, with, with information and some of it seems contradictory. Uh, can you clear that up? Can you tell me what the, I mean, I think the recidivism rate 
is it, in some ways could be a measure of the success of prisons, although we're only talking about the people who get caught, aren't we? We're not talking about the people who, who don't get caught the second time. But can you give me some feel for what the real recidivism rate is? Well, you make a really interesting point about measurement. So the only measure we've got is reconviction. So that means, first of all, you have to be caught. And secondly, you have to have a police service out there which is catching people. Um, and, and so the, the, the reconviction rate can be decided by how police choose to spend their time and how many of them there are. But typically, I mean, the, the, the good thing is that we've been measuring reconviction on a pretty consistent basis for a long time. And what that shows is that, although it's different for different lengths of sentences um, and for different ages, but for your average adults being released from prison, their chances of being reconvicted within two years of release are about 50-50. Um, so about 50% will be reconvicted um, within a couple of years. And that's been very steady for a long time. So it's, it's not a perfect measure, but it shows that um, prisons, whatever we're doing in prisons, isn't really having a significant impact on that rate. Um, the, the thing that we know changes reoffending is age, interestingly. So there's a... The, the age at which people commit crime, um, you know, peak age is early 20s. Um, by the time most people get to their early 30s, on the whole, they're not committing crime anymore, um, which is one of the absolute tragedies of long sentences, because the, all the things that cause that change to happen, it's essentially around maturity, which, again, you don't need to be an expert to understand the getting responsibility, growing up, having other people to care for, changes behaviour generally for the better. If, if you stop that happening because somebody's in prison the whole way through their 30s, 20s and 30s, then you're, you're setting yourself up for failure when people do finally get out. So, 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 so sending people to prison uh, can become a self-fulfilling thing. You're sending someone yes. to prison, you effectively wreck their lives. Um, and so they, they can't get back. They can't get back together. No, that's exactly right. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not embarrassed at all about the concept of punishment. You know, I've, I've had to think about this really hard because I've devoted pretty much my whole professional life yeah. to working on a system that punishes people. Um, and, you know, I, I, I regret that punishment is part of our society. But actually, I understand why it is. Um, and, and for me, the, the overwhelming argument is that if the state doesn't take on the business of punishment, then you leave it to the citizen. Mm. It's chaotic and unfair and dangerous. And anybody can think of circumstances. I mean, civil war is the most obvious example where those systems break down. And what we choose to do to each other instead is awful. Yeah. So, so the state has that responsibility to take on punishment because it doesn't. And, and I also, I, I entirely accept that for victims, um, there is something very sort of deep about saying there is there is a price to be paid for this, and there's you know there's nothing wrong with that instinct. But if the state is going to take on that role, it seems to me it has an absolute duty first of all to do it if you like with regret. So to do it to the lowest extent that it can, that is, uh, if you like, proportionate to its responsibilities. Um, but the second thing is that it has to do it in a way which gives people the chance to pay that price and not to go through it again, which is not, you know, that can get translated into a sort of pathological view where you think, well, we've miraculously discovered all the wicked people and if we can cure them, that will cure crime. That, Again, there's no evidence whatsoever for that. But it is absolutely part of saying um, if everybody matters, you're not allowed to give up on everybody, that part of what punishment allows is that second chance. It makes the possibility of a second chance. And then the last bit, which gets repeated endlessly, and which actually all politicians sign up to, is that if you don't take that opportunity, you're simply increasing the likelihood of another victim when the person is released, or indeed victims in prison. Lots of crime happens in prison. So, so why on earth wouldn't you do everything you can 
to get people to the point where they can be responsible, active citizens, caring for those around them, paying their taxes, you know, contributing. Well, that brings me on nicely to my next point, because uh, I want to ask you what kind of rehabilitation programmes are, are available in prisons that yeah. prisoners can take advantage of? Well, it, it, there's a very wide variety. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd go one step back and say, I think the way of life in prison is important to rehabilitation. And that, that was part of my this first really of my letter to Joe Ferrer about what the future of prisons should be. Um, that we ought to be aiming in prisons to mimic life in the community so that people who may well not have taken responsibility you know, for themselves or for those around them have the opportunity to learn how to do that and to practice it. And, you know, prison is a very disempowering institution. You know, it, it's convenient in prisons if people um, do what they're told, don't have to think for themselves, live by a routine. Um, it's not very good preparation for life outside. Um, but if you can get that sort of foundation of a good, active, responsible, civilised way of life in prison, then on that foundation you can do some really interesting work. So there are specific programmes which are sort of psychologically based, but tend to work in groups, often with prisoners challenging each other about the ways of thinking that led them to take the decisions that they took. Um, there are interesting sort of therapeutic approaches that deal, try and deal with the trauma that prisoners have suffered. Um, and then there's lots of skills-based work. So actually, if, if you're in prison because you couldn't make a living, then let's see if we can give you the basic skills and maybe higher skills, which will enable you to earn a living when you are released. How do you persuade an employer to take them on if they've come out of prison? Uh, you, you introduce them. You, you get them to meet face to face. Um, it's, it, it's a really interesting question because um, we put all sorts of obstacles in the way of employing people with criminal convictions. Um, and when, when people are sifting for jobs, that's one of the easy ways of getting a big field down to a small field. And so, well, we won't, you know, we won't look at anybody with a criminal conviction. My experience when I was travelling and the experience of lots of other people, the experience of my boss at the Prison Reform Trust, James Simpson, who runs the shoe repairers, is that prison is full. Prison is full of good, talented, nice people with lots of determination to do well. Um, not all, any more than, you know, the world outside has people who are all like that. But there are plenty who are. Um, and if they are given a chance, then they tend to respond very constructively to it. And, you know, I, I couldn't possibly have spent all the years I did working in prisons, and people who work in prisons now couldn't do that. You know, if they were surrounded every day by this stereotype of the prisoner who is, you know, completely feckless, unpleasant, out for themselves the whole time, it's just, it's not like that. You know, the prison population is a cross-section of, you know, personalities, um, the, the things that are distinctive of what we talked about earlier around poverty and and trauma and disadvantage, but not about what people are like. Now, plenty of people I admired who were prisoners, quite inspirational. So the trick is to put the employer in a room with the people that they might employ. And I mean, I think particularly in small and medium-sized enterprises, my experience when I was governing was that the people who ran those businesses put huge store by their instinctive judgment of human nature. Um, and, and they would say, I trust you, and that trust would be repaid. So James, my boss, James Simpson, would say that in his firm, you know, some of his best award-winning employees are the people that he's recruited and trained in prison. Okay. Listening to you all the way through this interview and actually reading some of the material, you giving me the impression that there's an awful lot of prisoners who are themselves victims. Uh, who have had uh, a very disadvantaged background. And my feeling, naturally, is that perhaps they shouldn't be in prison at all. Perhaps there should have been um, a more supportive uh, regime. And I'm sure that motivates you as well. Um, but there are some nasty people in prison, aren't there? There must be. There aren't many people in prison who haven't done something for which prison was an appropriate punishment now. 
I mean, that, that, that used to be true. If you look at women, there are still lots of women for whom prison is absolutely not the appropriate punishment. Um, and certainly in terms of victimisation, you know, we, we, we haven't got an exact number because um, it's impossible to do a survey which gets you to it. But we, we think that 60 to 70 percent of women have been victims of sexual um, or other violence before they come to, to prison. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's an appallingly common story. Um, and for lots of women in prison, prison feels like a safe place to, to be. But lots of men have been victims of abuse as well. You see, if you know that, if the judge knows that, if, you know, if, if the people in, in positions of power and authority know that, if they know that and they know that cause, what the hell are they doing? It's, I, I don't blame the judges. It, it's all before that. So when you were asking the question, uh, it's, if, again, if you sat in court and listened to the detail of the crime and listened to the victim's accounts of what they suffered, you would quite rarely, I think, think the judge has gone mad to send that person to prison. That, that's not the issue. You would often think, where have we failed years before that this person has come to this situation? Um, you know, very rarely you think this, this person is just wired up in a different way um, and hasn't got the same understanding of the way you treat a fellow human being that the rest of us have. But that's, that's rare. I mean, again, you couldn't, you couldn't work day in, day out in prisons if you felt that you were surrounded by people who kind of had no moral compass and who were completely unpredictable. Those, those people tend to stick out. They are, they are known about um, and require sort of a lot more help. But for most people, if you've actually got time to listen to the story, you would say, well, I can, I can see where this started to go wrong. Um, there are lots of people who work in prisons. If you said, if you, if you had all the money in the world, where would you spend it? They wouldn't spend it on a better prison system. They would spend it on better childcare. They'd send, spend it on the families who are struggling to cope when children are four or five. Um, you know, they would spend it on the people who dropped out of school, um, but who never get a chance to get back in again. Um, because that's, that's where the stories take you. So, you know, it, again, it's, it's the, there's loads of good stuff that you can do in prison. You know, no, nobody should work in prison unless they want to commit to making life a bit better for the people they're looking after. But you can't use prison to solve crime. Um, I mean, one of our publications, we, we do a little line of three graphs, which shows three different countries that have taken different approaches to imprisonment and contrast their prison population with their crime rate. Um, and the three graphs are all completely different because there is no pattern. You know, you can't, uh, you cannot demonstrate a link between how you use imprisonment and what happens with crime. Um, th there's a number which always staggers people when I tell them it, but it's, it's been true for a very long time. This is not a modern phenomenon. About a third of the adult male population has been convicted of a criminal offence and a criminal offence for which in theory they could be sent to prison. So, you know, this, this is not speeding. This is an offence for which you um, could end up in prison if we had a system that chose to do that. So a third of adult men. So crime, crime is an incredibly common thing in which millions of people are involved. Um, the prison population is about 80,000 of those people. So we're, we're not going to solve crime by miraculously locking up the most wicked people and changing them. I remember seeing on television as a senior police officer giving a talk to uh, um, policemen in training, on a training course. And he said, that, I want you to be honest here. He said, hands up all those who have never, never committed a crime in their lives. And there wasn't a single hand that went up. That was really interesting, wasn't it? Um, okay, so, I, I mean, clearly this is an extraordinarily complicated uh, issue. Um, but some people look at it very simply, as, as you, I'm sure you realise. Um, I mean, do you ever get criticised for being woolly-headed woolly liberal do-gooders who want nothing more than luxury for those who commit crimes? And what would be your answer to them? <laughs> 
Well, y- y- yes, of course. You don't know them, I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we, we do. Um, I, would always, I would always argue with Woolly Headed. I mean, I think, you know, the thing about the Prison Reform Trust is that we, you know, we, we put the evidence out there. You know, we, we just tell the truth. We don't sort of put a gloss on it. Um, I, I'm happy to be called a do-gooder. I think it's weird that that's become a term of abuse. Um, and, and actually, I've, I'm happy to be called a liberal because I, you know, I, I went to the sort of school where you had to do your Latin. And, you know, the root of being a liberal is that you care about freedom. Um, actually, I mean, I'm, it's not a political organisation. I'm not a political person. But actually, you know, a, a belief in freedom um, and the ability to make choices is a classic, you know, sort of right wing virtue. Um, you know, this is this isn't a left right argument. Um, I'm just intrigued by uh, this combination of a belief in, in freedom for a prison governor. Yeah, well, uh, I, mean, I understand that. I'm being a bit ironic yeah. there. But, uh, you know, it's it's something it, it's it's something we should regret doing. Yes, but it's I I, I don't want to be blasé about the experience of victims because you know, just as I said, actually, people like me. Would be deterred by crime, but we don't get the experience of imprisonment. The communities where most people come from who go to prison are the same communities where crime is the biggest blight on everyday life. I, I completely understand why, if your local community is being made a misery by young men behaving badly, that you want them exiled. You know that it's a perfectly rational instinct. The trouble is, it's not a very good way of solving the problem. Um, and and where local communities have got a grip on this, then they come to realise that it's not a good way of solving the problem. It, it's a temporary reprieve. And and for most crime, you know, if you think about drug related crime, if you if even if you get hold of the local drug dealer rather than the sort of the pusher. Um, as soon as they're gone, then the next person stepped into their place. You know, that imprisonment doesn't solve that type of crime. So th- there is something about giving people the fact. I mean, a couple of really interesting things around sentencing. And it, this is research, you know, this is not just opinion. Um, the first is a piece of research that shows that actually most people don't understand how severe sentencing is. So they, they think, despite everything they hear on the radio, well, it's probably because of what they hear on the radio, they, they think that people don't go to prison for very long for serious crime, and they do. Um, and, and I do blame politicians for that because it's politically convenient to say there's a problem to solve when there isn't. But the second much more heartening thing is that when you do exercises where people are given all the facts about a crime and about the person who committed it, and you do mock sentencing exercises, typically members of the public are more forgiving, are more lenient than the court. Um, People do understand where the problem starts and they do have an instinct to help. And that, that just gets submerged in the silly sort of temporary public arguments we have about this um but, but people who people who've experienced prison perhaps as a family member you know frankly they, they they don't think it's easy they don't think it's a holiday camp uh, they don't think it's not a punishment um but they also don't think it does much good um so so I, you know our mission our mission to try and educate people i mean you, you say it's very complex but actually it go, it comes back the things that I think everybody can understand quite quickly and quite instinctively. Um, and, and if you do that, you quite quickly get to the conclusion that prison is a necessary evil. Um, if getting to the conclusion about what you can do to make society a safer place, I think that's, that's a much harder question. Um, but, but you don't think that prison is the magic bullet. No, I, I yes, I, I did say that it was. Uh, it, it appeared to be complex, but I, I do agree with you. It's actually a very simple thing, but it's made complex because there's so much. It's a bit like education in government as well. Mm. It's made complicated because um, because it's such a political issue, uh, and yes. people 
care about it so much. So um, they do care about it. And it, you know, I. This is one of the things I can say now, which I used not to be allowed to say. But I, I do think some politicians bear they should have a guilty conscience about the way that they use crime uh, around election time. Um, I think I think they feed a fear. Uh, rather than seeking to allow it. And then they pretend that a very tough approach, whatever that word means, will do some good. Um, it's giving people what they think they want. Um, and, and both the main political parties have been guilty of this, and there's been a sort of an arms race over how punitive can you be. Um, and that's it's dishonest, and it builds up, it builds up problems for the people who live and work in prisons that that government never gets to see. So what, what the current government is doing, for example, in lengthening the time that people spend in custody, the, the consequences of that will be visited upon a government in about five or six years' time. Um, everyone who is pursuing those policies now will be in different jobs or retired or you know, um, possibly living in prison themselves, if they can call um, But... But the consequences of those policies are not now, they're in, into the future. And the, the benefits of those policies now are presentational and ephemeral. Um, and that's, that's a bad thing to do when there are people's lives at stake. I, I'm afraid I agree with you there. I, and it's not just politicians. I think uh, some elements, elements of the media as well uh, raise uh, hysteria. Uh, about uh, about prisons and about uh, about how we should deal with criminals. Um, a penultimate question then: um, Is there any country that you think is a kind of gold standard that we should look up to? That we should uh, we should aim to? I mean, uh, are there places maybe in in, in the Nordic countries maybe uh, that are better than others? Possibly, say the United States. Um. If you're looking at the level of individual prisons and how to run a good prison, actually there are examples in this country that are outstanding. Um, and, and we, you know, in years gone by, we have been one of the countries that others look to, and there are still individual prisons yeah. that are outstanding. Um, if you're looking at the level of prison system, then yes, some of the Nordic countries do seem to me to have a have a good principle basis for their imprisonment, and it feeds through practically exactly what I was saying in the letters to Joe Farrow. They, they have this principle that life in prison should be life outside, and they can translate it into the daily detail of how prisons work. But of course, they're not overcrowded, um, and they don't have very long... And above all, they release people. I mean, their, their recidivism rate is nearer 20%, but that's because they release people into a, a sort of social network which is which which sees people going to prison as a failure and could you say that again what the recidivism rate was it's about 20 percent in nordic countries um, and it's you know it's it's not a, a pure comparison but they do much better but fundamentally they do better because people go out to a system which supports them um, in terms of prison population i mean an interesting comparison is the netherlands which i think is, is quite like us in all sorts of ways um, and certainly Dutch politics have been quite like ours for some time. Uh, but they haven't increased sentences, and their prison population has been falling for a number of years. Um, because actually, because the number of crimes prosecuted has fallen, so it has just fed through, and they've been closing prisons. Um, you're right, the, the other end of the scale in terms of, if you like, um, systems built on kind of Western values. You know, in the, in the United States, then uh, the federal system and some state systems lock up, you know, a staggeringly high percentage of young black men. Um, and the, the sort of the, the, the belief in deterrence has been taken to insane extremes. So there's sort of two strikes and you're out for minor offences, life imprisonment or the second relatively minor offence has just resulted in systems where states are spending more on prisons than they spend on education. Well, I, I, was, just, I was absolutely gobsmacked when I, when I read somewhere that about nearly 1%, no, it's about 1% of the entire population of the USA are in prison, about 3.2 million people. But of course, uh, they're, they're kind of um, 
I, I understand that they're kind of free workforce as well. They actually do, they produce things for the US Army and things like that. Yeah, yes, um, they do. Um, that, that's true. But that's, you know, I don't, I don't think um, those states lock lots of people up because they want to work for us. It's because they lost control of sentencing. Mm. And, and it is, it's tragic because, um, as, as in our country, in our country, the, the racial disproportionality is very shocking. But in parts of the states, you know, it is, it is the sons of slaves who are now enslaved in the prison system. Um, I mean, if, if, if you think that even Donald Trump thought that it was necessary to reduce the size of the prison population in the states, you can see just how extreme the problem has been in some places. Again, not in all states, but in some. I didn't know that, but I am astonished. I thought uh, yeah. Donald Trump was a uh, kind of string him up guy. But um, yeah, the uh, I, I hope things change in America for, for the black community. Uh, but I think it's going to be a long run still uh, before you get some some sort of equality. Look, uh, Peter, it's been it's been fascinating talking to you. But I just feel that we've just absolutely scraped the surface of what the whole issue is about. Um, so I would like to end this by asking you, what is the single most important message that you'd like our readers to take from this interview today? I really want to. I, the, the first is find out more um, because it's knowledge is everything in this. And the more you understand, um, the more outraged you will be. Um, the, the, the second is show compassion to people who you come across who face this, whether it's someone who's been in prison, going to prison, someone's family. Um, we think something like 600,000 children have, are affected by imprisonment every year. Uh, through a parent in prison um, and that's it's it's just an easy thing to do to make it a bit better if you come across it well look peter i, I i'm so grateful to you for for agreeing to uh, come online here i'd like to maintain some sort of contact uh, with your organization if i may um and i, I hope i can persuade the other editors that perhaps we can paste a link, not just to this interview, but also to your communication with the uh, with, with the minister, um, some direct link, so they can press the button and they can read. Because I, 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 I've got a I've got a copy of your your letter here, your message here, um, and I can't read it all out. It's nine pages long, but I think it, it holds so many so many vital and important issues that I think our readers should should at least be aware of. No, because well, it seems to there's a smoke screen over this, and I'm anxious to get it over with. Well, David, I'll be I'll be utterly delighted if you did that. If there is um one, one document for people who know nothing about prisons, we publish twice a year something. We call it the Bromley Briefing, just because it's um it's funded by an organisation called the Bromley Trust. But I also heard about that. I haven't read it yet. Go ahead. Well, it's it's really worth it, and you'll see why I sound like I know what I'm talking about because we just collect interesting numbers it's it's not got a slant on it it's mainly published government numbers about prisons and prisoners and um, i guarantee people will be astonished by what they read in there so you know they, 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 you don't need to be won over by argument just just read some of the facts and it will make everybody stop and think i will do peter thank you thank you so much for the interview no, it's a real pleasure thank you um, just before we, uh, we, we come off air, or, or rather, this is not for the recording, whoever's recording this is cut off. Um, uh, I, I've got a confession to make because uh, in, in a previous existence, I, was, uh, I, was a, I worked for the post office and I was an area manager. Uh, and part of my job was to interview people to be counter clerks. And uh, there was one guy who, who, dotted, who crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's and he was, he was really good. Um, and he told us, and he seemed a really good guy, and he passed all the tests. And I, uh, and uh, he said, I think you ought to know something. He said, um, um, I have been in prison, uh, and uh, I kind of swallowed hard. And I thought, well, what do I do here? You know, uh, what was it for? And he said, actually, it was murder. Uh, I don't, I don't know the details, but he told us that he'd murdered his wife. 
And I was interviewing this guy with a, a woman who was uh, also an area manager with me. Uh, and she was determined to employ him because she thought that he needed a, a, another chance. Mm. He needed a, a chance. Now, for the job that he was doing, he's going to have access to thousands of pounds, tens of thousands of pounds. Um, and, uh, and of course, his crime had nothing to do with any financial uh, situation. And to my shame, and I'm not proud of this, I was the one who stopped it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take him on. Um, and in fact, in, in the post office at that time, they would never, you know, uh, we, um, I was part of the system, I suppose, that would not take people like that yeah. on. So I, I think for any employer, um, you have to think about what, you, what you're doing. If you turn somebody like away, so, uh, David, it's you know, we don't, don't beat yourself up. It's a very common story. I mean, that's why I said about the small businesses. But on the whole, those are places where they make their own rules, um, and they can trust their instincts. But no, I guarantee you, if you had employed him, I'm sure your organisation would have said you can't do that. You know, we've got a policy that prevents it. Um, but, but you're right. Um, if it's any, you know, if it's any consolation, the person who runs our finances or finance director has a criminal conviction um you know and as, as do a third of my colleagues <laughs> um you know it's we're lucky because it's actually relevant in our work it's an advantage um but no it's crikey well there's there's i'm, I'm not an expert on it the, the, the <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Well, I told the editors, that uh, uh, the other editors, that when I was uh, seven or eight years old, I used to go to Woolworths and nick things uh, with a, a friend who was uh, a bit more experienced than I. They were absolutely horrified, absolutely horrified, because obviously, you know, my colleagues have never, and David is probably watching this now. Um, I, I mean, uh, David had never done anything like that in his life, and I believe it. Um, so there you go. Um but none of us is entirely clean. Uh, I was I'm sure say, even okay. David has got his warts. <laughs> anyway, we won't go there. Anyway, it's been a delight. Thank you yeah. so much, Peter. Well, thank you for the opportunity. You know, as I say, we exist to try and get people interested. It's brilliant. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Right. Be good. Bye.